Thank you, David, for serving as our reader this morning of these two powerful and beautiful readings. Grace and peace be with you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has said, I have come to give you life, life abundantly, from John 10. People of joy, first events in stories are usually quite important. If you open a new book, then the first impressions, the first introductions of the characters, of the plots, set the tone. These first impressions help us to anticipate what is to come. They shape expectations. First events matter. Each of the four Gospels, which tell the story of Jesus' life and His ministry, starts with some kind of introduction of Jesus. Usually, it is an encounter with His cousin, John the Baptizer. And then, follows some sort of, or some form of a calling of the first disciples. As Jesus walks around the shores of Lake Galilee and he calls the first set of disciples. Then, each marks the move to Jesus' ministry by describing a particular event at which Jesus stands out to people. Mark, which was the very first gospel written, the first thing that Jesus does is he casts out an evil spirit out of a man who is possessed by this demon. So we have in Mark, the first event is a healing. In Matthew, which was the second gospel written, the first major event of Jesus' public ministry is his Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes. So, Jesus teaches a very large crowd of people from the mountain. And in Luke, the third gospel written, Jesus first preaches in a synagogue announcing his intention to heal and to feed and to release the captives and bring good news to the poor. We will be hearing that reading next Sunday. So, first impressions, first things matter. Here in John, which was the last of the four Gospels written, the first thing that Jesus does is not to preach, not to heal, not to teach. He goes to a wedding, to a Jewish wedding. How different from the other three. A wedding, a party. More than that, Jesus and His disciples not only attend the wedding, but Jesus saves the day, turning water into wine when the wine had run out. And this is no ordinary miracle, no, quote, business as usual kind of miracle for Jesus, as if that even exists. The first public act of Jesus' ministry in John is attending a wedding and is changing approximately between 120 and 180 gallons of water that was used and originally intended for purification purposes into not just some cheap two-bottle wine off the shelf, but into the best wine. How many bottles are we talking about? I spent some time trying to do the math here. I had fun with that. I mean, it's a, 
story about grapes. So how can I not spend time with all these grapes? Consider this. So, a standard bottle of wine is about 750 milliliters, meaning that a case of 12 bottles from total wine contains <laughs> contains 9 liters or 2.37 gallons. Yes, it's true. I did the math. At approximately 150 gallons, That becomes a little more than 63 cases of wine. With 12 bottles per case, we have at least 756 bottles in total. Yes. So, because this is a story about abundance, let's round up. And assume 180 gallons for the miracle at Cana. And we are now talking close to a thousand bottles of wine. Yes. Yes. I had fun with this. Now that's a lot of grapes. What difference do these facts, however, make? I think it starts breaking down for us just how much... Abundance is implied here. Because this is a text of abundance, of extravagance. And the key, I believe, the key to this text, which opens the rest of John's Gospel about abundance, is found in the first chapter of John, in verse 16 in that prologue, that profound and poetic introduction to the telling of Jesus' story, where John writes, from his fullness, we have received grace upon grace. So not just grace a little bit, but grace upon grace. An abundance, an extravagance of grace. Or grapes. Or wine. Or life, as Jesus will say later on in John's Gospel. And that is the case here. Because to run out of wine at a first century Jewish wedding would not just have been embarrassing for the hosts, but literally disastrous. If you want to ruin your reputation, run out of wine at a Jewish wedding. Then, wine, wine was associated with blessing, with joy, with goodness. And so when the hosts run short on wine, it implies you have run out of favor, you have run out of blessing, and that's a disaster. To run out of wine would have felt as if a curse would come over not only the hosts, but also the couple that has married. Like you'd run out of blessing, out of God's blessing. So Jesus doesn't just offer enough wine to cover the balance here, but Jesus turns six huge washing jugs of water into wine, providing more and more wine and blessing, which is implied than they could have ever imagined or ever consumed. And more than that, as the steward acknowledges, it's the best stuff they've had. And they're into the third day. (laughs) So this is what grace looks like. That's what this text wants to tell us. Grace, of course, is one of those words that while it is central to our vocabulary as Christ followers, it is often also equally hard for us to imagine, to describe in a concrete and meaningful way what exactly is it, grace. John reminds us that grace upon grace means abundance. 
as an unbelievable, more than you can possibly imagine, abundance. Which is why it's significant that in the fourth gospel here, John describes the first thing that Jesus does as providing, yes, more wine, implied Jesus provides more joy, more blessing than this couple and the hosts, or any couple, for that matter, could possibly have imagined or deserved grace upon grace because that's what grace looks like. It's not limited. It's abundant. I have come to give you life, Jesus says in John 10, life abundantly. And so, when we look at this text of abundant grace, we also see surprising grace. Surprising grace. Think about that. Think about that in your life. Think about an example of surprising grace in your life. Just when you thought, it seems like the world is coming down hard on you. Just when you think you're not good enough. One of the most vicious judgments of our culture today. Not good enough. Surprising grace comes to you from someone who says, You are a beautiful person. You are beloved. Just when you think, maybe this is the craziest idea you ever had of. Surprise. You feel affirmed to go forward with that seemingly craziest idea. Just when you think, You know it all. Surprise. Surprise. God taps you on the shoulder and says, hold it for a minute. You don't have it all figured out. And we've heard stories this morning from Ann Kinney, her experience, from Heather and Lance. Abundant, surprising grace. God, surprising grace, is there, ready to transform, to heal, to celebrate. How has God surprised you by God's abundant and surprising grace in these first 16 days of 2016? And here's something else that's really important about this text. As much as we may want to think that this abundant, surprising grace is only for us, we need to read and listen again. Because this story also shows us that God's grace is to be shared with others because the setting of this first sign that Jesus does in Cana in northern Israel is essential. It is a wedding. And at the wedding, all the guests, not just the chosen few, all the guests will get to experience this act of abundant grace. All will watch the steward pour wine into their glasses and when they thought their cups would perhaps stay empty. All will be surprised. All will take that sip and all will say, where did this come from? Because God's grace is for all children of God. As much As much as we, as we, yes, often try really hard to limit God's grace to just us. So grace, people of joy, 
Grace upon grace is not a concept, but is the embodiment, the incarnation, or the enfleshment of God's love. It's not an idea, but it's the experience of God's love poured out for all. Not something to be kept to ourselves, but to go about sharing it. This is what our mission statement reminds us of. Sharing Christ's love, growing God's family. Jesus creates abundance. Yes, wine upon wine, blessing upon blessing, joy upon joy, grace upon grace. That is the opening of this story, the opening tone. And we should take note because as this story reminds us so powerfully and so beautifully, first events matter. They set the tone. Jesus, what a tone you've set for us. Thanks be to God. Amen.